Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Greg Broyles. Um, the purpose of this is to spend 20 minutes talking about tax. Um, a little bit about me. I got a law degree from the University of Oregon in 1996. I went back to school and I got a master's in taxation from Golden Gate in San Francisco in 2005 and not especially related to this morning. I'm also a specialist in California in a state trust and probate. There's basically three things I wanted to do today. The first is I've been disappointed when I've seen people discussing Bitcoin and tax online that I felt like there's been a lot that hasn't been mentioned, so I wanted to add to that. I wanted to encourage people to start discussing what I'm talking about. I'm not here to say that I know all the secrets and everything that I know is right and everybody's got to listen to me. Maybe I have it wrong, but I thought let's, let's start talking. Let's get other people sharing ideas about this. The third is my goal today is not to argue with the people who want to say that Bitcoin isn't taxable or taxes don't matter. I'm aware of that opinion or that idea and we don't have time to fight about it today. So I'm just going to chug along with my thing and people that think that they can get their 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to start out with one thing that's not always clear if you haven't taken a tax class. And just by way of background, today I'm talking about taxation for US citizens and permanent residents. If you're in another country or you're not a permanent resident, I don't know anything about your tax situation. So feel free to ignore me. Um, but for people that are a permanent resident or that are a citizen, we're gonna start out with the rule Gross income means every dollar you get, no matter what. There are some exceptions, but the tax system starts out with the expectation that every dollar you get is taxable. I've got up here a site, 26 USC 61. That is the actual Internal Revenue Code section. Um, if you wanna go read it, it's a lot longer than this. I cut off the list, but you get the point. The other piece of this, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the dry, boring law, is taxable income means gross income, which means all your income, minus specific listed deductions. So if people start out by saying, well, I'm not really sure if I make some money, I don't really know if it's taxable or not, the tax lawyer answer is, oh yes it is. Um, <laughs> The, one of the frustrations I've had with people talking about taxation for Bitcoin is that they've adopted a very binary view where they say either everything you ever do is fully taxable no matter what with no deductions and you got to give the government half of what you make and that's it and it's over or they say none of this counts it's all fairy money the government can't see it can't touch it don't know about it they're too stupid so we don't care about tax and I think that binary view of it is unrealistic. What people that think about hacking on taxes for a living do, we don't usually say, oh, I did this fancy thing and I'm a winner and I'm never gonna pay any taxes on anything. That's not realistic. What we do do is try to make the situation as good as we can. There's three basic tools that we have for that. One is talking about characterization, and that means identifying an item either of income or expense and thinking about how can we force that into the best possible category for us. Another piece of that is what we call timing. Choosing when we have to recognize this item because in a lot of cases we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have some control over do I want this thing to show up on my tax return this year or next year or in 10 years. The third thing that we think about is what we call opportunity shifting. Maybe there's some other taxpayer or some other entity that would pay a lower rate on this income or that would get more benefit out of this deduction than I would. So we think about 
is there a way that I can move this tax item onto somebody else's tax return? Getting a little deeper into characterization. For the purposes of this morning, I'm gonna say I think there's basically five kinds of income that we might have. The first is self-employment. If you work for yourself, the government expects you to pay <clears throat> your ordinary income rate, whatever that is, plus 15% self-employment tax. That 15% is meant to cover the Social Security and Medicare that would be withheld from your check if you were working at a job. So in a lot of ways, self-employment tax or self-employment income is the least favorite kind that you can get because the tax is going to be the worst. Another category, and I'm going to talk more about these two later, is hobby income. I think a lot of people that are doing Bitcoin, their income is probably hobby income if they're not doing Bitcoin from a strong business point of view. Some people mine just a little bit. I think that's probably a hobby. That's also taxable as ordinary income, but we treat the expenses a little differently. The third would be sort of your bread and butter income like you would get from an interest on a bank account, get up and go to work at your W-2 job, that sort of thing. There's investment income that usually gets favorable rates, capital gain rates, and the fifth is collectibles, which I mention mostly so that you've heard of it. I don't think it applies to Bitcoin. And we probably don't want it to apply to Bitcoin because it's got one of the worst rates. If you're thinking about monkeying around with your taxes or you want to understand your taxes, one of the most important things for you to do is understand what bracket are you in. Right here, these are the brackets for a single person in the United States. These change every year. You know, these numbers aren't magic. What's important is understanding the structure, that we have these different brackets about where they break. If you're married, these are going to be double that. But if you're married, maybe your spouse is making some money too. Anyway, coming back here, we can see if we've got an ordinary income, if I get up in the, in the morning and I go to my work, get a W-2, I'm going to pay this rate. The 10 or the 15 or the 25 or the 28. If I, if I get self-employment income, I'm going to pay that rate plus 15%. The 15% only applies to the first 100,000. If I find a way to make some money, let's say I own some stock, or I own some Bitcoin, or I own something else for a year and a day, I can call that long-term capital gain and I can pay only 25% on it. If you're not in the 25% bracket, there's got a 15% capital gain bracket. The last is the collectibles at 28. Like I said, I don't think that really applies. In terms of timing, the trick with these brackets is we usually don't want to have one really high income year surrounded by a bunch of low income years. So what we'd like to do typically is control the timing of income or expenses so that we can smooth out our income over several years. So if I know that I'm going to have a big influx of income, maybe I'm going to accelerate some deductions into that same year. Or maybe I'm going to try to slow that down. If I'm sitting on a big pile of bitcoins and I've got a big gain there, maybe I'm going to sell some of them in December and I'm going to sell some of them in January. And I'm going to split my gain across two tax years. So that rather than having one year where I'm in a 33 or 35 percent bracket, Maybe I've got two years and a 25 or a 28. There's three basic rules I'd recommend to you or to think about. A cash basis taxpayer, and that's what you are if you haven't talked to an accountant and done something different. You recognize income when you receive it, and you recognize an expense when you spend it. So if somebody gives you a dollar today, that's income today. If you spend a dollar buying a cool thing today, that's an expense today. So that's where we might play games and say, OK, hey, boss, or hey, other guy, I really don't want you to write me a check in December. I want you to write me a check in January. Or I'm going to spend a bunch of money in December, and then I'm going to get paid in January, or vice versa. But we want to be thinking about where am I in these brackets so that you can think about timing. For an investment, we recognize gain or loss 
when the position is closed. I'm gonna get, talk a little more about that later. The third thing to know, and this is an exception to the first rule, if you're spending money on something where you can depreciate or expense equipment, let's say that you're mining BTC, or let's say that you're, you've got a cool startup and you're gonna buy a bunch of computers for your people to use. We take the deduction on that spending when the equipment is placed in service. So this is mostly interesting with like the ASIC miners. Let's say I paid somebody a lot of money last summer because I was excited I want to get an ASIC miner. But I don't actually get my miner until this summer. When I do my 2012 tax return, that ASIC expense doesn't go anywhere because I haven't placed that equipment in service yet. But when I put it in service in this year, I can take my expense in this year even though I spent the money last year. And opportunity shifting, I've already talked about this some. The basic idea is thinking creatively about, do I have a kid, do I have a spouse, do I have an entity? Is there some other taxpayer that could use this item better than I could? Could they use it at a, an income? Could they put it in a lower bracket? If it's an expense, could they put it in a higher bracket? I've got three basic suggestions for dealing with uncertainty, because almost all of the Bitcoin in taxation is uncertain. The first is to be reasonable. You don't have to be perfect. The IRS hasn't told us yet what they want to do with Bitcoin. So you don't have to guess right. You have to guess something reasonable. The second would be you should be consistent. One of the issues that's going to come up is converting Bitcoin to dollars. When you buy something or when you make some money, you're, you know, the tax return doesn't want Bitcoin numbers, they want dollars. So we're gonna to have to make conversions. My suggestion would be pick an exchange, either use the, the actual valuation you got or use maybe an average for the day. Bitcoin's a little tricky because we don't really have closing prices it's the way that the stock market does. So you, know, you can take an average for a day. My suggestion would be be consistent about how you do that and I think it would make sense to always use the same exchange. I don't think it would be reasonable to say, oh, well, prices are high on this exchange and prices are low on that exchange, so I'm gonna use this one when I sell and I'm gonna use this one when I buy. I think you should stick with the same exchange if you want this to survive IRS scrutiny. The third is tax people and accountants talk about materiality. Materiality means, is this important? A lot of things aren't important. Like when tax people file returns or if you use TurboTax, it doesn't even use pennies. They don't care about cents, they just ignore them. There are a lot, of a lot of things that are just too small to worry about. So if it's, a, if it's a tiny number in the scale of your return, don't worry about it, it's okay. The, the goal is to get a reasonable big answer, not absolute perfection. Um, let me just go a little faster because I'm running out of time. Let's say we bought a BTC for 25 bucks in May of 2012. We sold that exactly one year later for 125 bucks, so we made $100. Because we did not hold that for a year and a day, that's gonna be short-term capital gain taxed at our ordinary income rate. So whatever your rate is on that chart, sorry, you're, that's what you're gonna pay on. Same scenario, but we waited an extra day to sell. Now we held it for a year and a day. Now we've got long-term capital gain treatment. So we've got a better income tax rate just because we knew about the year and a day rule. So if you're sitting on your coins for a long time, be aware, if you could hold it for a year and a day, you're probably gonna get a better result. Let's say things went the other direction. We bought some Bitcoins in April when everything was crazy. And then that made us sad and we sold them in May. <laughs> and now we lost some money. That's going to be, in this case, it's only one Bitcoin. We only lost 125 bucks on it. That's going to go on our tax return as a loss. This is one of the things that I've been disappointed nobody talks about. If you lose money on Bitcoin, I think it's deductible. You know, it may go in a different place on the return, but if you lose money, you should put it on your tax return. You know, if you're gonna put it on when you make it, you should put it on when you lose it. Let's make the picture worse. So, <laughs> you know, let's say we put 
25K in, in April, and we managed to turn our 25K into 12K in May, and now we're sad again. <laughs> we still put this on our tax return as a short-term loss. The difference is we can only use $3,000 a year towards other income, so we may be nibbling away at this $12,000 loss for four years, unless we manage to make more money, and then we can net those two apart. But again, my basic point is, don't forget about your losses. One thing nobody's talked about that I've seen, there's two forms that people with foreign investments might want to think about. The first is there's a TDF 90 form. If you look at the bottom of Schedule B, there's this box here, Part 3, Foreign Accounts and Trusts. Most people just blow right through here. This asks you some questions. Do you have an interest in a foreign financial account? If you have an interest in a foreign exchange, my hunch is you probably ought to be checking yes. But the good news is you don't need to check yes if your balance stayed below $10,000 for the entire year. So if you're just a little guy and you're just playing around, you're probably clear to check no. But there are people that have a lot of money in Bitcoin. There are people that put a lot of money in foreign exchanges. I think those guys ought to be checking yes here. They ought to be filling out this magnificent form. This is due January, June 30th of the, of the following year. And let me get back to my thing. The other, there's a new form just started this year, is the 8938, which is an IRS form that goes with your tax return. IRS wants to see this if on the last day of the tax year you had $50,000 in a foreign account, or at any time during the year you went over the $75,000 mark. Those numbers are doubled if you're married. And IRS wants you to fill out that form. TurboTax ought to do it for you, or you can't not to do it for you, but it, it's out there. So I'm just mentioning it so that, you know, I haven't heard people talking about it, but I don't see a good reason why those wouldn't apply. I would make a distinction between holding, let's say I've got $100,000 in Mt. Gox or MT Gox, I don't know how people say it, over in Japan, or let's say I've got $100,000 in BTCE. I think you would need to file those forms. Let's say I've got $100,000 in BTC held in a wallet on my computer. I don't think you need to fill out those forms because that's not a foreign account. That's something that you, you possess. But when there's this other entity in some other country, I think you should think about the forms. Let's say you put some money into Pirate, and let's say Pirate ran off with your money. Um, the good thing is Madoff has made this a lot clearer for us in a tax point of view. Um, IRS has told us what they think we should do. If there's a criminal fraud or a criminal embezzlement, if we have criminal activity, we treat that as a theft loss, not as a capital loss. The difference is it means it's going to come off your income all in one year, not in little $3,000 nibbles. The downside of that is if you don't have enough income to eat it up that year, you just lose it. So let's say you're chugging along and you make $40,000 a year and you save your money really diligently and then this pirate guy comes along and he says, I'm going to pay you 10% and you put all your life savings in there and he takes $200,000 of your dollars. You can take a $200,000 deduction, but if you're only earning forty k a year, the worst you're going to do or the best you can do is bring your forty down to zero, the other 160 of loss is just gone. Unfortunately, that's how IRS says they want to see this. The other possibility, and I'm operating from the point of view, I think Pirate was a criminal. There were, as I understand it, people, they were calling them Pirate pass-throughs, that invested other people's money in Pirate. I think some of those people, at least, were honest, maybe a little optimistic, but I don't think they meant to be criminals. Those people, or if you put money in an exchange and the exchange shut down and your money disappeared, I don't view that as a criminal loss, just an unfortunate event. In that case, I think capital loss treatment would be appropriate. Um, let's talk about mining. I think the big question about mining is, is this a hobby or is this a business? When we're trying to figure that out, IRS has a long list of things to think about. It basically boils down to, did you have a profit motive? Did you operate this like a business? And was there a significant element of pleasure? 
the thinking being. <laughs> well, where that's coming from, there's people who say, oh, I'm a golf instructor, so all my golf clubs are deductible. And every time I go to the golf, every time I go play golf, my range fees are deductible. And, you know, there's one of the tricks in the tax world is trying to take something that you enjoy and turning it into a deductible business. And this is one of those pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered things. So this is what IRS is going to look at. Don't enjoy it. Don't have any fun, and then you're cool for taxes. <laughs> um, the downside of that, I believe if you're mining as a business, I think that's going to be subject to self-employment income. Spend a lot of time thinking about it. I don't like that result, but I can't really come to a consistent different one. The good side of that, your expenses for mining are deductible. If we're going to treat mining like a hobby, there's some guys who chug along and then they post, they're like, hey, I'm mining with my CPU, how come it's not working? I'm not getting any bitcoins. Um, I'd call that a hobby. <laughs> um, they're going to pay just their ordinary income rate and they can deduct their expenses and itemized deduction. The other thing to understand before you get stressed out and I say, oh, that crazy guy at the conference said I have to pay. Um, if your net self-employment earnings are under 400 bucks, you don't have to pay self-employment tax. So if you're just chugging along with one, with one graphics card and you ever, never really make a lot of money, not self-employment. Here's another thing I think people have forgotten. If you're mining and you're making money with mining, you probably spent money on hardware, you probably spent money, I know you spent money on electricity. You may also have a home office expense. You can deduct space in your home if it's used regularly and exclusively for business. So if you've set apart a, a bedroom or part of your garage, you may be able to deduct home expenses like rent or mortgage, property tax, all sorts of things, just for that piece that was used for business, but it's out there. Yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, you just throw anything on there and it's good. I mean, it should be real if you're going to take that. But there are people, I've seen pictures where people put a lot of money into hardware, they, they devote space, they have cooling, they really go at it. Um, if you're going to deduct your hardware, we can depreciate it, which means taking deductions for it over time. We would do that over a period of, it's a, they, they think of it as having a five-year life, but they spread it out over six years. You can take what's called a 179 deduction, which means you'd take it all in one year. But as I said before, the, the problem is, got to be placed in service. So if you put a lot of money into an ASIC and you haven't got it yet, no deduction yet. Do you have a question? The question I have is, uh, I know we're talking about uh, the, the tax impact of, of coins and whatnot, but in its current state and the volatility, you may buy it at one price and, then it, it, and you hold on to it for a long period of time. When do you realize the tax impact of it? And that's one, one part. The second part of the question, as, as a business or perhaps like an online wallet, uh, where uh, you may um, accept payment for your services um, uh, from as coins, how how do you go about start starting to compute the, the tax implication? Is it the uh, the value of the coin when you accept the payment, or the value of the coin when you try to realize it? Okay, so we got two questions. The first is uh, given volatility, um, when do we recognize gain or loss? The answer is we'd recognize it when we close that position out. If I bought a hundred bitcoins today, I don't know if I made or lost money until I sell them someday then someday in a week or a month or a year or a decade when I sell them, that's when I've got an open and a close and I can say, okay, here's, I know that I made money or I know that I lost money, it's gonna go in that tax return for that year. So the other, lost it, or so it needs to be um, entirely worthless. Okay, but what price do you count it at? I would look, whatever you paid, whatever you put in there in the beginning. Okay. Plus, if you happen to report some income along the way. You know, let's say I put $100 in Pirate and then he told me that I got $50 in dividends or 50 BTC in dividends and I actually put those 50 BTC on a tax return, then I would value my loss at 150. Um, the other question was about if you get paid in Bitcoin for doing a service. Um, 
My view is you have self-employment income at the moment that you get paid. The value would be we'd look at what was that Bitcoin worth on that day. Yeah. If you sit on that Bitcoin for another five, ten years, whatever, the cleanest thing to do would be to, to sell it and rebuy. Um, because then you're, you're clearly got long-term capital gain treatment on that Bitcoin. If you sit on it, I think it would be reasonable to take the position as long as you're reporting that the, the, the gain of the Bitcoin is income, that the appreciation is long-term capital gain, we don't have any clear guidance. Okay. Hi, um, Hi. How would you treat um, coins received through mining? Through mining? Yes. So my vision of that is that they're not taxable until you get rid of them. It's essentially, I think of mining as like growing a tomato. Okay. If you grow a tomato in your yard, nobody cares. If so you if take I'm, that tomato to the farmer's market and you sell it, you've got to pay tax. Okay, so if I'm mining for three years and, I don't, and I'm just hoarding coin... I don't um, think you have I'm anything to worry about from a tax point of view. The interesting okay. thing is going to be someday you're going to swap those for money or you're going to swap those for goods. Right, because I wouldn't be showing income for, for, income for, th for three years. Right. Okay. But my answer is a little bit like I just said to the other guy. Your, your best opportunity might be to, to buy and re sell and rebuy as soon as you mine to make it absolutely crystal clear you want long-term treatment for the appreciation. Because the mining, in my view, is subject to self-employment tax. So I would hate to see you mine today and get a coin that's worth 100, and if in 10 years Bitcoin's worth a million dollars, the argument could be made you've never realized that income, you're going to pay self-employment on the million. I see. Not on the 100 today. I get it. Okay. So, so, just under, so you're saying to buy it right away so that you know the strike, whichever buy price of, of the assets that when you sell it later. So the idea is to, to make a split between, you know, let's say I mined a Bitcoin today and, I, and it's worth 125 bucks. Yeah. If we listen to me and I say that it's just like growing a tomato, you don't have anything until you sell it, and then you sell that thing in 10 years, that to me looks like you just sold the world's best tomato. But if you sold your tomato today when it's worth 125 bucks, and then you bought some other tomatoes as an investment, then those investment tomatoes would get, get long-term capital gain treatment, not self-employment. Yeah. I was wondering if you had any comments about uh, doing tax loss harvesting with Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Um, I think with traditional securities, you can't rebuy the same security. So. Right. There is a, there's a rule called the wash sale rule that says that you can't close out a losing position and then buy back in immediately and take your loss. Your loss is suspended. And I absolutely think that that applies to Bitcoin. Don't know why it wouldn't. What about uh, buying into an alt chain like Litecoin? Um, I don't see a problem. I, I, I wouldn't apply the wash sale rule to that as long as they're not essentially the same thing. Okay. Thank you. And, and from my view, Bitcoin and Litecoin are not the same thing. Thank so, you. Anybody else? Okay, we're done.